Hello and welcome to today's Focus on webinar um, covering the detection of prenatal mosaicism using QFPCR. We are delighted today to have two of our prenatal expert advisors with us um, who will be presenting on this complex issue and providing an invaluable educational session today um, and they'll also be hosting a question and answer session at the end. Our presenters today are Susan Hamilton and Stephanie Allen who are both principal clinical scientists based at Birmingham Women's Hospital. Susan and Stephanie have extensive experience in prenatal diagnostics using various genomics techniques and we have been lucky enough to have them both on board as Gen QA assessors and expert advisors for many years now. So for the question and answer session at the end, we would ask attendees to please input your questions in the chat box, selecting send questions to staff and we'll pick them up in real time and we can present them to the presenters at the end of the session. So at this point, I think there's nothing else to do but to introduce Susan Hamilton, who's the first speaker for today. Susan, hand over to you. Thank you, Fiona. So um, we're going to be looking um, initially at um, background to mosaicism and particularly how it applies in prenatal tissue and then uh, looking at how it, it's um, detected by QFPCR and um, eventually we'll get to some case studies, um, just looking briefly at some literature. So obviously um, we need to define mosaicism and it's the presence of two or more populations of cells um, in a single individual um, who's arisen from a single conception. And it can be uh, the result of many different mechanisms uh, through chromosome non-disjunction and anaphase lag and endoreduplication. So uh, in some way, there is a, a mistake in a cell division, either at meiosis or mitosis, that leads to uh, the formation of two different um, cell lines um, following different mechanisms. So it's particularly noted in CVS um, and it's reported in about one to two percent of diagnoses. Um, and this is a broad general figure um, for all um, CVSs, for all chromosomes and uh, through different techniques um, that have been involved. So um, chromosome analysis, um, which was used from cultured cells, um, will detect pseudomosaics which have arisen purely in culture and are not representative of the actual genetic background in the CVS itself. Um, and there are various um, guidelines that we'll come on to later that explain um, the nature of that. But a true mosaic will be representative of the fetus itself and not just of the placenta that you're sampling with the CVS. But it can be just confined to the, the CVS uh, and the placenta. So you can uh, take a, a CVS biopsy and you would either detect one or both cell lines. Um, any placental sample has a risk that you only detect one cell line. Um, and that's in the nature of the risk figures that patients are presented with. Um, when CVS is discussed, that it won't always be 100% representative of the fetus. But again, it's it's a, it's not a huge risk, um, even um, even though mosaicism is comparatively common. And even rarer mechanisms will be um, where the fetus starts out trisomic um, from the conception, and there is then a rescue event uh, that that leads to a mosaicism which can um, lead to uniparental disomy in certain chromosomes. So whatever you do with a CVS, it's really important to be aware of the technique you're using, um, the cells it will be looking at, what's happened to those cells, whether they've been passaged in culture, whether you're looking at um, both of the uh, tissue cell lines that are known to exist in CVS, the trophoblast and the mes mesenchyme, or whether you're looking at um, information now um, from released into the maternal circulation in, in um, uh, blood for an, an IPT. So the, the figures that are usually quoted for mosaicism, as I've said, for CVS, it's around 1% to 2%, much lower in amniocentesis. And most of these will represent uh, true fetal mosaics. 
But as we know, mosaicism um, will di um, differ for different chromosomes. For, so for Down syndromes in live births, mosaicism is extremely rare. About 1% to 2% of Down syndrome individuals will have mosaicism, whereas the level is much higher for um, chromosome 13 in particular. And for the sex chromosomes, um, for monosomy X, in particular, it can be around 40% of cases that are have some degree of mosaicism. So it, as well as depending on the sample type that you take, um, it depends on what you're actually um, querying, which chromosome you're querying. Um, it has been reported in fetal blood samples, but again, this is going to be representative more like of the fetus. And you can get rare mosaicism between the T cell lineage and the B cell lineage. Um, which has been more recently seen now that people are looking at microarrays, where you're looking at DNA from whole blood rather than um, T cells, which have been stimulated to produce metaphase preps. And then obviously as well, um, a compounding um, factor can be maternal cell contamination. Um, it's more likely that you would get that um, in an amnio through maternal blood, um, because of the nature of the way that CVS are cleaned and sorted um, or should be to ensure that there is no maternal decidua um, associated with the sample. So there are lots of different ways of, of getting mosaicism um, and this is quite a complex slide but you've got two uh, mosaic, non-mosaic approaches at the top where you've got a normal fetus in white or you've got a completely abnormal fetus and placenta in the grey, you can get mosaic, you can get confined placental mosaicism where you've got an abnormal cell line in the uh, placenta, but the fetus is normal. You can get um, you can get an abnormal and a normal cell line in the placenta with an, a true mosaic uh, in the fetus, where the fetus has both cell lines. So again, at any point, you could sample one of those two. Um, cell lines in the placenta and not get a clear result of the fetal genotype. Um, you can get a completely abnormal fetus or a completely abnormal placenta with a mixed um, mosaic fetus. Obviously, if you've got a normal placenta and the fetus does have mosaicism, you're going to get a false negative. Um, and if it's the other way around, where the fetus is normal, but the placenta is completely abnormal, you're always going to get a false positive. Um, and so there, there are lots of different complications with CVS that are in the nature of the sample um, and not necessarily um, directly related to the test. So in QF-PCR, quantitative fluorescent PCR, we're looking for the common aneuploidies um, and we're doing it in a rapid way. Looking at uh, markers across the length of the chromosome that are going to give you as much information as possible about whether the, the whole chromosome is involved or whether um, there might just be a small portion of the chromosome involved. And that's why um, best practice guidelines are set up to look at multiple markers and to state um, the, um, the actual um, markers that you've seen that are trisomic along the chromosome to say how much of the chromosome is clearly trisomic from your test. So um, we can visualize the markers um, in, a, in a quantitative way that is um, largely representative of the starting material and gives us a ratio of the alleles present um, within a normal range. And there's a clear normal range, um, a clear trisomic range for where you get a one to two or two to one ratio. Um, you can see three alleles, um, which is clearly trisomic. But if the markers fall within those two ranges between normal and trisomic, you get an inconclusive result. So this is um, a mosaicism for uh, a trisomy 18. And in these two markers, there are three um, different alleles, but they're not in a one to one to one ratio. So you've got one peak uh, that is smaller than the other two, and the ratio of the two um, larger peaks is going to be in the one-to-one -one ratio. So you've got two cell lines, one of which has got two of the alleles, and one of which has got all three of the alleles. 
And you can um, approximate uh, the level of mosaicism by looking at um, the uh, ratio of the um, the trisomic cell line to the to the disomic cell line. But it's um, obviously that's only representative of the sample you're looking at, not necessarily of the tissues in the fetus. You can also see here that um, there are the other three markers that have been used in the assay and none of them are giving a normal result. So you've got a small peak, um, even where there is an uninformative um, 18 marker, you've got a, a smaller peak present. So all of these will give you an abnormal ratio. So um, if you've got a trisomic conception, you're gonna get three different alleles present. So the presence of three different alleles indicates that you've got um, either a, a meiosis one or a meiosis two um, with recombination present. And if you then go on to get a, a trisomy rescue re, um, result, you're gonna get um, a disomic cell line. So it can happen um, either way, uh, but this way is, is the, um, the way that you would get a, a, a triallelic result either a full tri trisomy or a mosaic uh, trisomy result. Now, this is the other um, situation where you can see a trisomy 18 mosaicism, and this is where all five markers are giving you an inconclusive ratio with no evidence of, of a third allele present. And this um, is most likely to have been a normal conception with two alleles present, but then you get a meiotic, a mitotic, sorry, a mitotic non-disjunction event to generate the abnormal cell line that you're seeing. So two of the chromosomes are identical because they've um, just um, um, non-disjoined in, in mitosis, um, and you're going to get these abnormal results for every marker in the um, in the assay for that chromosome. So the difference with um, maternal cell contamination is that you're going to see that affecting every chromosome. So it's not specific to uh, just one chromosome. All chromosomes are affected. So all markers will be um, inclusive in some way or another. So you can see here that you've got um, lots of uh, um, markers showing three peaks but then they're, they're in a different ratio and the way to um, see that is the characteristic pattern that you've got a maternal allele only a fetal allele only and a shared allele that the fetus has inherited from the mother where the um, maternal and paternal um, alleles are different sizes so um, there is that ratio that you can apply um, to try and uh, see that, that that's the most likely explanation is the maternal cell contamination. That if you add together the uh, fetal only and the maternal only contributions, they should be the same as the shared allele um, because you've got those two genotypes present in the assay. If you've got mosaicism, you're going to see um, just a different pattern because you wouldn't get that that adding up because you've got the the disomic cell line and the trisomic cell line um, and you you've not got um, a different um, pattern um, of the a plus uh, the b plus c equals a. So you can see this, and sorry, this is a bit of a small screen, but you can see a um, very low level um, mosaicism with extra peaks um, that would not correspond with a stutter peak. Um, so in the far left, top left, um, there is a small peak, which is the wrong side of the allele to be a stutter. Um, so that mosaicism, you would be looking for small extra peaks that aren't um, um, where you would expect the stutter you get skewing of the allele ratios um, and you would get subtle, you can get subtle skewing um, of the, um, the allele such that the larger allele where you would expect preferential amplification of the smaller allele through your, for your, from your PCR, you get it skewed in the wrong direction. So again, that's something to look at. Obviously that's not definitive, it can just be a PCR artifact. 
But when you're seeing that consistently across one particular chromosome in your assay and not the other chromosomes, it would indicate that there's something happening with that particular chromosome. And um, there have been papers looking at the assays and determining that um, QFPCR can detect mosaicism um, of at least 15% um, in the sample. And obviously there will be occasions where just because of the way the alleles fall, the way you can detect lower than that. Um, but um, it's quite clear that QFPCR will detect um, at least 15% mosaicism reliably. So um, when we first started doing uh, CVSs by QFPCR, um, the discrepant um, CVS results between um, direct chromosome um, analysis and cultured chromosome analysis had been widely reported, but we started to see discrepant results um, at WIN QFPCR um, when the technique was first adopted. And so we looked at, in greater detail at the particular cases how they'd um, been arisen and did additional work on them to try and work out what was going on. And um, it was clear that um, when we were um, doing CVS from small portions of a single frond of villus, um, there was far more uh, chance of getting a wrong result or a mixed result. So following these um, initial reports, the best practice guidelines in the UK were updated to reflect the need to have a mixed cell lineage by um, digesting the CVS or macerating the, the whole CVS biopsy rather than taking a small portion um, just for the QFPCR. And then in 2012, um, the UK re-audited all its CVS data to look for um, whether the change in practice had led to a diminution in the number of discrepant results. And that's what we did indeed find, that where the sample had been dissociated um, and represented both cytotrophoblast and mesendermal tissue, then there was a, um, less of a chance of a discrepancy and the vast majority of discrepant cases that were found were um, biallelic for all markers. So again, if you've got a triallelic result in a CVS, then there is still the small associated risk that it's um, not a true representation of the fetus because you could just be sampling one of two cell lines that are present or again, there's the very small chance of a trisomy rescue as well. But that's a limitation um, more related to the CVS. And so when you do see a triallelic um, result, um, it's less likely to be incorrect than if you get a biallelic result. But even then, the, um, the risks of a biallelic um, result um, being uh, leading to a complete uh, discrepancy and a misdiagnosis was extremely small. So around one in 5,000 results um, altogether, and the vast majority of those were biallelic. Um, so there is evidence that a triallelic result is more reliable than a biallelic result. So caution where a biallelic trisomy is seen is appropriate. Um, however, the, the um, last audit we're aware of in the UK was in 2012. So we're, we're nearly 10 years on from that in terms of the numbers of CVS that have been um, performed. And um, we have not seen the numbers of discrepant results that we were seeing when the techniques were being moved from the original single frond to a digest. So it's important that if a biallelic result is, is obtained, that um, the report makes that clear um, to the um, clinician and that it's appropriate to wait for the chromosome culture result before taking any action in the absence of ultrasound scans findings. So this is just to illustrate that if you start out with a really small amount of material, you can get um, only one of the two 
um, cell lines present, but if you mix everything up, you are going to get a mixed result. So it's really important to detect mosaicism um, and to look for it at low level. And uh, it, it should be being detected, um, as we've noted. So it should be seen at, if you've got it at 20 percent, we, we expect that the laboratory would detect that. Um, and that if there is um, evidence that might make you think of mosaicism, that, that things are investigated more fully. Um, if you've got a clear mosaic result, it's important to report that at the, at the time of the QF-PCR. Um, and it's important to, to test the dissociated cells rather than just a spore front. Obviously, as things have moved on with um, non-invasive testing, um, there's been concern about discrepancies um, and the fact that you're looking at similar um, information in that the um, um, free fetal DNA will have come from the cytotrophoblast. Um, so again, the QF-PCR is one stage better in terms of looking at a more mixed cell population and is considered to be a more definitive um, result with um, the NIPT being considered a screen. But if you, in your QF-PCR, following a high, high chance um, NIPT result, are seeing a triallelic result, the UK uh, FAST recommendations for laboratories now are that um, a triallelic result is expected to represent the genotype of the baby. And if there are scan findings, it, it's not appropriate to advise waiting um, for um, any therapeutic action that the patient and the clinicians wish to take. However, if it's a biallelic result, it's still important to consider whether it's appropriate to wait. Um, and again, in the presence of scan anomalies um, that would um, uh, be in line with that finding, um, it, it's likely that this is the correct result. But where um, confined placental mosaicism is strongly suspected in your result, um, it's better to wait. So where you've got um, information that is strongly suggesting that the result is correct on the basis of the ultrasound scan and the NIPT and the QF-PCR, then waiting for any further testing is not required. But if you have, haven't got um, ultrasound scan findings and you've got a biallelic result, um, it's important to wait. If you've got a triallelic result, then it's likely to be um, a discussion as to whether the woman wishes to wait or wishes to take that small risk that it is mosaic and the, and um, it's that the result is discrepant, but it is a small risk and therefore it's 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 patient choice. So there's lots of things out there to aid interpretation, and there are literature reviews, there are lots of best practice guidelines. It's really important just to use the most um, up to date guidelines. They are that being revised on a regular basis as more uh, literature and information becomes available and there are sort of standard texts and um, I've put there the um, the UK um, uh, FASP details for the fetal anomaly screening program with the details that I've used in those slides. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Stephanie Allen now to present some cases. OK, thank you, Sue. So I'm now going to take you through a few case presentations to illustrate what Sue's just talked about. So these are um, cases that were run in our lab. Um, and so obviously these are using our markers and your markers may differ. And um, this is just an illustration of our markers. So we have one um, PCR multiplex kit, which has got all the blue markers in it. So it's got a range of markers on each of chromosomes 13, 18 or 21. And then we have backup kits for each of the chromosomes, which are the green markers, if we need to run more markers to investigate unusual findings. Um, and I've just put on each slide um, the table at the top, which is the, the ratio. So you're looking at the ratios either of peak height or um, peak area, dependent on the recommendations of your analyzer. Um, and the, these ratios are in the best practice guidelines. Um, so these are basically what you judge the, the results on. So I'll take you through these. Um, cases. So first case um, is a pregnancy with a combined screening test risk of 1 in 150. 
trisomy 18 and 13. Um, it's a, a CVS sample was taken at 12 plus five weeks gestation and sent to the lab. Um, and this is the result. I hope you can see it because it's not a full screen. Um, so this is one tube QF-PCR and it's got all these markers in it. So there are four different um, dyes, different colors to separate the markers out. Um, and then also they're separated according to size. So the peaks with the numbers underneath um, are, indicate the size of the peaks. So I can just show you with the mouse. Um, so there's a, a lot of markers within this. So chromosome 21 marker, 21 marker, 21 marker, 13 marker, 13 marker, 18 marker. So you can hopefully see those labeled above. Um, so we have five from each of the chromosomes in here. And then we also have AML, which has got a peak for the X and a peak for the Y. Um, so this helps us to look um, at basically at the sex of the fetus, but then also if there's um, any maternal cell contamination. And you may have a different um, combination of markers within your lab. So what I've indicated on here, um, I've circled um, the markers of interest. The ratios aren't all indicated on here, but I've indicated where there are unusual ratios to, to sort of be, be aware of. So obviously with this case, it's a one-to-one -one ratio for chromosome 21. So you can see the two markers at the top there, that's an uninformative marker. Um, that's a one-to-one -one ratio, and that's an uninformative marker. So it looks okay for 21. So the 18s look one-to-one. -one. So there and there, I hope you can see the mouse. But when we look at chromosome 13, it looks abnormal. Um, and so these are the ratios. So 2.6 for this marker, 0.77 for this marker. And then there are three alleles, so a triallelic result with these markers, but they're not one to one to one. So they don't fall within the, the sort of standard trisomic range. They fall outside the range and the inconclusive range. So that raises alarm bells as to the presence of mosaicism for trisomy 13. Um, we don't need to run any more markers, but we, we did with this case. So I'm just showing you some additional backup markers, trisomy 13. Um, and you can see again the skewed ratios, um, 0.65, which is not within the trisomic range, um, 2.6. So, so another indication of mosaicism for trisomy 13. So going back to Sue's um, figure, it looks like the, the possibilities are one of these three. So you're seeing mosaicism within the placenta, which is what you've analysed. So there are different, three different scenarios, either the fetus is normal, the fetus is abnormal, or the fetus is mosaic for the trisomic cell line. And it's a triallelic conceptus, um, as we know, because we've seen three different alleles on QFPCR. So, and if we go back to the reason for referral, it was a combined, it was a um, combined screen test risk, and there's no other indication on there as well. So we need to take that into account. So obviously it's appropriate to, to report the evidence of mosaicism for trisomy 13, as indicated in the best practice guidelines, um, and you would report that to the clinician. But however, mosaicism in CVS is not considered to be a reliable indicator of the true fetal genotype, as it may represent confined placental mosaicism. And as the patient was referred due to an increased screening risk alone, um, you may wish to consider a detailed ultrasound scan to further investigate this result. Um, and also, obviously, as discussed previously, we recommend waiting for the result of the full carrier type. Um, dependent on the ultrasound scan findings and the full carrier type result, you may wish to recommend taking um, an amniocentesis because that, that's the way, so that's the way you would get a more accurate representation of the true fetal carrier type. So that's case one. Case two is a pregnancy at one in 120 risk of Down syndrome following first trimester um, combined screening. So screen risk again and the CVS taken again, um, this time at 13 weeks gestation, sent to the lab for testing. So this is the result we got. So if you look at chromosome 21, that's a one-to-one -one ratio. I haven't put all the ratios on here again, but these were within the normal range. Chromosome 18 within the normal range. Chromosome 21 looks fine. But if we then look at chromosome 13, which is circled, um, there are um, abnormal results um, and the ratios are within the trisomic range. So 0 0.49, 0 0.52, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.6, 2.
2.01, 1.98. So they're bang on within the trisomic range. However, they're all biallelic results. So there are no markers where there are three alleles. So we would then go on to run more markers because obviously we're concerned at this point um, that it's a biallelic result. We're concerned about the risk of mosaicism. So we want to see if there are any, any markers that we have that we can run that will give a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one result. So we run our backup kit and this is our result. Um, there's a few split peaks in there, a bit, bit of artifact. Um, but th so these are our final four markers. And of those, the three that are informative are all two to one biallelic results. So we have no triallelic results and no further markers to run. So given that this is a scan, um, a, a screen risk CVS, um, no indication of any scan findings at this point. It's a CVS and they're all biallelic results. Um, this raises the risk of a, a, my, so, um, a mitotic error, as Sue talked about previously, and the risk of mosaicism um, is increased. So in our report, as um, said previously, um, we would say, so we would obviously report um, the abnormal result, but we would um, caveat it with the results indicate that the abnormal cell line may have arisen as a post-zygotic event. So in all abnormal results on CVS, we would flag the risk of confined placental mosaicism, but we would put more of an emphasis um, where we've seen a complete biallelic result, which is rare, um, or is more often than not, there are triallelic alleles. Um, so in this result, the results indicate that the abnormal cell line may have arisen as a post-zygotic event. And so the possibility it may be confined to the placenta should be considered. So we would recommend karyotype confirmation unless the ultrasound scan findings are consistent with the diagnosis, as in a small proportion of cases, um, CPM can occur where the findings would not represent the fetal karyotype. Um, and it's important that we put that on and we do actually communicate that to the referring clinician as well to, to make sure that they appreciate this result. So case three. Um, so this is a patient who has had NIPT for trisomy 13, 18, 21, um, and it showed a high chance result for trisomy 13. So an amniocentesis has been taken at 15 plus two weeks gestation and sent to the lab um, and no ultrasound anomalies um, were reported um, in the pregnancy. So this has been run on QF-PCR. And you can see here for all three chromosomes that they would give a normal result um, with a, a ratio within normal range. You can't, so there, there are enough informative markers and you can't see anything. There's nothing, nothing on the baseline even. They're very clean, no skewing of the ratios. They, that looks like a fully normal result. So we would report that as no evidence of trisomy for 13, 18 or 21, um, and that the result is not consistent with the NIT, NIPT result. And it supersedes the NIPT screening test result. And we know it's a screening test. We know that there's the possibility of false positives and false negatives. So this isn't a surprise. Um, and we don't do any further testing beyond that because the QF-PCR result is the gold standard result. We haven't seen any evidence of any mosaicism. So that, that's the end of the testing for that case. So case four is a pregnancy at one in 150 risk for Down syndrome on first trimester screening. An amniocentesis was taken at 16 weeks and noted to be blood stained. So this is the result when it's been run on QF-PCR. So this is a obviously an, um, a very messy result. Um, and when we look at most of the markers, there are different peaks um, and they're all at different ratios. Um, and you can see characteristically the sort of pattern that you get. Um, and if you run the maternal blood alongside it, you can actually match up the, the peaks to the maternal blood. So this is what we would suspect based on the refer and the fact that it was blood stained is likely to be um, maternal cell contamination um, and due to the blood staining. Um, and you can see it's in all chromosomes. So you're not worried about the possibility of mosaicism particularly, it's just in all chromosomes. So obviously you can't report that result because you, you can't interpret it. It sometimes does help to have a, a maternal blood sample to run alongside it so you know that that's what it is and if it just, you know, to, to um, for confidence, um, but obviously you can't report that result. 
So um, we would report it that the sample is unsuitable for QF-PCR analysis due to evidence of mixed genotypes suggesting the probability of maternal cell contamination. And obviously where that happens, we then have to culture um, and carry a type and do any analysis on the culture so that we can get rid of the blood staining um, in culture. Then case five um, is a 17 week pregnancy with an increased screening risk for trisomy 18 of one in 40. Um, another amniocentesis, and again, so the sample is heavily blood stained this time. And this is what it looks like when we've run it. So it doesn't look quite so bad as last time, um, but you can see individual little peaks if you look very closely on the baseline. Um, and it's some skewing of the markers, so skewing just outside the normal range on different chromosomes, so not, we're not worried about mosaicism, we're, we're, and particularly as we know it was a heavily blood stained sample, um, we're worried about the risk of blood staining. So we can see that all the way through, and I've indicated with arrows where the little extra peaks are. Um, so according to the best practice guidelines, so, so this case, we look at the AML, and there's only an X peak in the AML, so it obviously, if this were a male fetus with, mater with um, maternal cell contamination, then you'd be able to see which was the majority genotype. But as, as there is no Y peak here, it's quite difficult to interpret that. Um, so actually, if it's heavily blood stains, um, we don't know which way around it is. So it could be that it's the majority of the fetus and it could be that it's the majority of the mother. But either way, according to best practice guidelines, um, if it skews outside the normal range, you wouldn't be able to report this anyway. You need to culture it and karyotype it. If this were a case where um, we, where they were all in the normal range and it was still a female fetus, then we would have to be very cautious as well anyway, because we don't know which way around they were. And it could be that it was completely maternal. So in cases such as that, it can really help to run a maternal blood sample to compare um, to make sure that you're looking at the fetus and not the mother. So in this case, again, um, the sample is unsuitable for QF-PCR analysis due to evidence of mixed genotypes, suggesting the probability of maternal cell contamination. And as stated, be, be very wary that you, you could have the majority maternal, you don't know which way around it is. Um, we would culture and karyotype um, before reporting result. Um, and, um, in, we usually, where a sample is heavy blood stained, heavily blood stained, we would request a maternal blood sample anyway and run it alongside um, the amnio, just so we know we can interpret our result dependent on what it looks like. So that's the end of all my cases. Um, and so we'd like to um, take any questions if anybody has any. Hi, Sue and Stephanie. Thank you very much for, um, for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat. One of them is, what about mosaic triploidy? Would that not look like maternal cell contamination? Yes, indeed it would. It's difficult to tell the difference between um, the triploid, uh, diploid triploid mosaicism and maternal cell contamination, but only if you've got 50% um, ratios. If you've got a small amount of the um, diasomic cell line or the other way around, a small amount of the triploid cell line, um, you should be able to see that the, the, the ratio, the, the MCC ratio of um, the, the maternal only and the fetal only being equivalent to the share doesn't work. Um, but actually, you know, it, diploid, triploid um, uh, mosaicism is, is rare. But, but that's the way you would see it, that the, the MCC ratio that I described wouldn't work if it's a diploid, triploid mosaic. And also you'd be highly suspicious if you've got a heavily blood stained amnio in the first place, that that was far more likely scenario. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We've um, got another couple of questions coming through. So there's a question regarding maternal cell contamination on QF-PCR. Why not just perform the QF-PCR on the cultured cells rather than the karyotype? I mean, it, it depends on your local practice. Um, for us, um, we would do the karyotype because by the time you've actually cultured the cells up, um, it, it, it depends on what's going to be the, the you know, your your preferred test locally. Um, with the karyotype, obviously, you, you're, you're looking for other things as well. So if it depends on the consent um, and, and local practice, um, our practice is just because at that point we, we've 
it's as quick to do the uh, the, the carrier type um, from the cultures as it is to extract the DNA and rerun the QF PCR, but either is appropriate. Um, okay, it, there's a, there's because you're up. because you're thinking about the possibility um, that you if if the majority of the the um, QF PCR initially was the maternal sample, you don't have a maternal blood to check that out. Um, you can't exclude the possibility at the sort of mosaicism we've been talking about um, in your QF PCR. So um, chromosome analysis, if if you find a mosaicism, um, you know, it's it's the most it's the most reliable way of looking at um, you know the, the individual cell lines. So there's a, a small benefit in that, but it just depends on what your local practice is. Okay, I think it was regard to the the MCC, and I think they were sort of saying that if it's a normal female G band, um, how can you be sure that it's not maternal contamination? So if it's an amniocentesis, then um, the um, the blood will not be um, dividing in culture from the mother because you need to stimulate your blood cells to actually get them to divide. So because of the way that you're culturing your cells, um, you should have, um, as well as just washing out the blood, you shouldn't really be um, culturing up your, um, your cells. I mean, obviously, if there is a small placental plug in there, there is a risk. Um, but the chances are that you're um, growing up um, the fetal cells. And again, most people's reports will be caveated um, for the very rare situation where you have got a heavily blood stained um, sample that you can't get a QF PCR result and then your cultures you get complete maternal cell overgrowth it, it's one of those where it, it's it's multiple small things but it could happen so re reports are caveated for that that potential okay thank you um, we've got another one do you mention the possibility of CPM on the report, even if you get a triallelic pattern at QFPCR? Yes, so in all our CVS reports, we have a, a rider on there saying that there's a very small risk of CPM um, in CVS. It doesn't matter whether it's triallelic or biallelic. Yeah, because as I mentioned, inevitably, if you've got a placenta with two different areas of two different with the cell lines in, in the biopsy, you may only in any CVS, you may just sample one of two cell lines present. That's a risk of the test. That's a risk of CVS in any CVS, whether you get a perfectly clean result, normal result, or a perfectly clean trisomic result. Um, it's just a, a limitation of the test, which is why patients are counselled about um, you know, the, the nature of CVS compared to the nature of amnio and what you're looking at. With a CVS, you're, you are looking at placental material and you're looking at a small amount of placental material. Whereas with an amnio, you're looking at cells mostly from the fetal skin and the fetal urinary tract. So you, uh, you've got a much more likely chance in an amnio that you're looking at the, the fetus. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another question about mosaics. Uh, can we calculate the percentage of mosaics and how can we calculate it? From the QFPCR result, yes, you can. Um, it's not, I mean, it's how you, relevant that yes. is, really. <laughs> you can do it, but um, even if you were looking at um, an amniocentesis, um, well recognized um, tri, um, mosaic trisomy 20 is known to be in the uh, largely in the fetal urinary tract. So you can get a skewed result. So you might say that there's there's 50 percent of the cells have got trisomy 20, but that doesn't mean that the fetus is 50 percent mosaic for trisomy 20. You've got a mosaicism, but, you, you know, it's tissue specific. So mm -hmm. it's why would you it's when you found it, you found it. You don't know the implications. You don't know the um the impact that it's going to have on the fetus, it, it will depend on the tissue distribution and the, the relevance of, of the mosaicism, the specific mosaicism you found. Okay, we've got quite a few questions coming in again. Um, so if you confirm maternal contamination in case five, could you interpret and inform the result, the fetal result? Which one was case five? That was, was that the low level one? 
I think that was the heavily bloodstained one. So sorry, so, what was the question? Sorry, the question was, if you confirm maternal contamination in case five, could you interpret and inform the fetal result? So basically no, from so, no... So we wouldn't. So even if we know that it's likely that the majority was the fetus, it's still according to, I mean, having a look at that, if you knew that the majority was the fetus, you're not too concerned, but you can't you can't exclude the possibility of low level mosaicism. So according to best practice guidelines, if any of the markers are outside the normal range, then you would just not report that. You would report that as maternal cell contamination. Um, so. OK. Um, I've got another one. If there are is, is sorry, if there are three alleles in the mosaic, how can you use that to exclude CPM due to um, trisomic rescue? Is that referring to a particular case, or yeah, they haven't given yeah, a case so if, number. If you've got a tri, if you've got a triallelic trisomy, um, yes, you can't exclude the fact that you then go on from a a, tri, a triallelic conception. A trisomic conception you then get trisomy rescue but you've only detected one of those two cell lines um it, it it's one of those where yes theoretically it, it, it is a risk and and that's why you would still quote that there's a risk in any case but it, it's it's sort of like multiplying a very rare thing by a very rare thing um, so yes, it's still it's still a possibility, but it's an extremely remote possibility. And again, it depends on your chromosome. So some chromosomes, um, even if there was uh, a UPD, um, you wouldn't be as worried. Um, so yeah, it's all everything sort of <laughs> it's it's a balance of probabilities and a balance of risks. Um, and and with a triallelic starting and then getting a um a trisomy rescue that you then are reporting as a trisomic but you've actually got um a, a disomic fetus it's going to be rare okay if you don't see mosaicism okay we've got, we've got a question about whether qfpcr is a useful contribution to confirm diandric triploides or partial moles what would your opinion be yeah, it can be if you've looked at the parental. You would need to look at both parental genotypes to be to be sure. I mean, we have seen on um, fetal loss samples where you get um, all the markers are uninformative. So there's so there are no one to one ratios that the, all the markers are identical um, because you've got a pattern and, and you can show that they're paternal if you've got a paternal sample um, and you've got um, a full molar pregnancy. Um, as I say, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see that um, in a prenatal sample. Mm -hmm. So it can be useful if you think that you've got um, a molar result to actually look, use the, the parental genotypes um, to actually assess what you've got in the, in the fetal um, sample. But actually, um, for the most part, um, there are other better ways of yeah. doing it, like looking at the um, beta HCG levels in the maternal circulation um, and um, other things that you would want to do if you suspect there might be, um, a, you know, a molar pregnancy um, for follow up. So it's one of those where, yes, you can do it, but again, it'd be local practice as to whether it's useful or not. We, we wouldn't usually run the, the parental samples, so you could decide to do that, but it would be a you would be doing it specifically for yeah. that. Okay, um, I've got a question about the best practice guidelines here as well. So it says the best practice guidelines state that the ranges for the abnormal triallelic ranges are 0.45 and 0.65, and between 1.8 and 2.4. <laughs> you're remember. quoting 0.45 and 0.6. I think they're just asking why you're using different ranges. Is that mine? I'll go back and check that. Apologies if that's <laughs> if that's crept out of on our SOP. Um, thank you for pointing that out. I shall go and check. Okay, thank you. By um, the way, once we've checked, we'd be using what it says in the best practice guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. Our slides. 
I just had one other question, and that was to do with um, the mosaicism levels that you had at the beginning for the different chromosomes, and why you get different mosaicism levels in the live born to say chromosome 21 and chromosome 13. Okay. So, I mean, I just mentioned that I don't think I actually had a slide that, that said that. Um, yeah. That's just from um, the data yeah. for live borns. Um, and yeah, it, um, it, it's not entirely clear why. It's obviously biological function. Mm -hmm. But, um, the, you know, the, the within the um, postnatal and prenatal confirmed samples with trisomy 13, there are far more mosaics that are true mosaics than you would get for trisomy 21. And, and I think when you look at the levels um, for 21, 13 and 18, um, that in part goes to some way towards the um, the false, um, the um, specificity and sensitivity of NIPT. But mm -hmm. in it, part of it is related to the fact that there, there are a lot more mosaics um, in 13 than there are in 21. We know that the NIPT is is pretty good for um, detecting um, trisomy 21, but much less um, so reliably for um, 13 in particular. So is this a, with the, the biological nature, so that is this you're a, much more likely to have a mosaic for 13 than you are for 21. So is this a sort of prenatal diagnosis or is this at live born? I think the figures were at live born. Right. Okay. So it could be just to do with survival and the fact that uh, the full the full trisomies thirteen either don't get far enough to be live born or don't get far enough even for. Detecting. Yeah. Well, I mean, both both eighteen and thirteen eventually are not you know are not viable. Yeah, um, not viable. So. so it's much less deleterious anyway. So. So, so yeah, unless it's I mean, mosaic, you might not get that far. Basically, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's all the questions. If there's any others in uh, the chat that haven't been answered, then uh, we will get answers to you. And I would just like to say thank you very much to our two presenters. Um, and just remind people that the next focus on is on Wednesday, the 15th of December, and it's to do with DYPD uh, EQA. So thank you very much and goodbye.